to start with that the, the, the reason for this 50 ways title came about because this is Citizens for Conservation's 50th anniversary. And so over the years, we've done all sorts of programs on ways to improve habitat in your yard, one or two at a time. And so what I've done with this program is pulled lots of things together, packed a lot into an hour, and consequently, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each plant or each item that I'm, I'm presenting, but rather uh, a, a big overview of, of lots of things. But I'd also like to say that the program has already been, vid it's a, on video uh, on the Citizens for Conservation website. So instead of having to really uh, scramble to, to take notes on things that are of interest to you, if you want, you could just wait and, and I'll, at the end, I'll give you the, the URL to get into the uh, website to see, you know, just to look at it over again. Or if I went too fast over something and you'd like to, to look at it again uh, or listen to it again, it'll, you can find it on that, on that recording. So given that, let me get started. Um, the, it, we're, we're talking about habitat in a broader sense. <clears throat> I wanna see if I can uh, do this. Um, this is a, a quote from Douglas Tallamy. Some of you may have heard of him. He has really been the guru that's pushed for individuals to do more uh, use of native plants in our, our yards uh, in, into what he calls the backyard national park, that there's so much land in the US in yards that is just in lawn, that if everybody would switch from lawn or some lawn to some native plants, we would have the equivalent of the largest national park in the country. But in the past, he says, we've only asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. But now we're recognizing that they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So we've got a bigger task ahead of us. And the reason is that 95% of the original habitat in the US is gone. So that means 95% of the original native species will go extinct if we don't recreate some of that habitat. So that's a tall order. Uh, but, and, and yes, we have things like forest preserves and public lands that do some of it, but there's so much more land that we have in private hands that, that we each can do more. And I expect most of you, see if I were in person, I could ask for a raise of hands of how many of you already are gardeners or how many, how many are already using native plants. But uh, I'll assume some of you do and some of what I'm saying might be uh, not news to you, but maybe I hope you'll pick up a couple of new things this tonight. So these are the categories I'm gonna be talking about, <clears throat> all of the different ways that we can uh, improve habitat. And I'm going to start with native trees. This is a photo of Baker's Lake in Barrington. If you don't know where that is, uh, you should. <laughs> it is a preserve that is on uh, just south of Highway 14 and the railroad tracks on just the, east, the southeastern corner of Barrington. Uh, and and the, the crossroads to get to it is, is Highway 14 and um, Hillside. Anyway, this is a, a property that is owned by the village of Barrington, but Citizens for Conservation has been stewards for it and restoring it since the 80s. And right now, if you have a chance to go visit, there's a walking path to go through it. It is the best woodland wildflower show you'll see anywhere around. It, it, this photo doesn't show it too much, but it's just covered with blooming flowers and May, uh, May like now and, and into May is the best time to visit it. But I'm showing this because I wanna talk about oak trees. One of the, if, if you only, if you don't have any oaks in your yard now, this would be the one thing I would say, figure out a way to get an oak planted in your yard because they used to be the predominant woodlands, oak hickory, in this area and are mostly gone. And oaks support more species of life than any other plant. And, and you know, the, there'll be caterpillars that feed the birds or that 
uh, they have acorns that feed the birds and the squirrels, or you know, all of all of the various things that we'll be talking about. A lot of them are come from oaks, um, and there are species of oaks that and hickories that fit almost any condition. I'll talk a little bit more specifically about them. And by the way, all of the plants I'm talking about in this program are native to, to Northern Illinois. I also wanted to share with you, I, I should look it up and get the specific numbers, but a few years ago, maybe five years ago, Lake County did a survey of trees in the whole county, an aerial survey. And they found that, and this is what, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it was something like 65% of all the trees in Lake County were buckthorn, invasive buckthorn. And the problem is that the, the oaks, when they're crowded out by buckthorn, the little oaks don't grow. So we have, we have our old, 100 year old oaks around a few still, not anywhere near as many as we had, but little ones aren't coming up because the buckthorn's crowding them out. So plant an oak if you can. The white oak is a, a beautiful tree. I have a lot of shade in my yard. Actually, I have a, a remnant oaks and I, they weren't planted. They grew up together and they are quite close together and consequently they aren't this wide. <clears throat> they are much skinnier. <clears throat> but in, out in the open, they, does it like, like sun or a little bit of shade, they will be a beautiful tree. Big. There's another one, the red oak, that is a great tree as well. Uh, can be a little in a little drier spot maybe than the, than the white oak. Um, also wants full or partial sun. Doesn't get quite as big typically. And I don't have the photo here, but in the fall, the red oak is the one that has a, the really vivid maroon color to it. But we also recommend getting hickories. And this one's a shagbark, a uh, beautiful tree. Uh, they, it also says full sun, but my hickories are growing in or their little grove and they have sort of shaded each other. They're not, they're not as, as, the branches aren't as wide, but they're healthy. Um, and this bark, First of all, it's attractive, but it also harbors little critters. And particularly the morning cloak butterfly uh, lays its eggs under there. And so if you have one of these, once in a while, you might see a morning cloak butterfly flying out from under the, the shags. And of course it has hickory nuts, which is also a, a, a good source of food. The, the I have a ton of squirrels in my yard because I have a nutty yard. I have oaks and hickories and walnuts and the squirrels love them all. But here are some of the other native trees that, that support the diversity. In addition to the shag bark hickory, there's the bitter nut hickory. It doesn't have the shaggy bark, but it has spectacular golden uh, leaves in the fall. I'll show you a picture of that a little later. And the hackberry is a good one. Not too many people know about that. If you're looking for a tulip tree, be sure you do so by its Latin name, the Liriodendron tulip fera, because there's lots of things called tulip trees. And if you want, you know, want, the reason we're pushing for the natives is because the native pollinators and birds evolved with the native plants. And if we bring in a cultivar, sometimes they're useful, you know, the the hummingbirds might still be able to get their pollen and, and nectar, but or the bees might get the pollen and the <laughs> birds get the nectar, but sometimes they can't. You know, whatever it was about the natives that, was, that they grew up with are the ones that they need to continue to use. The yellow birch, there's several birches that are native that are good. Uh, I don't know if you know, you probably do know the redbud, but if you have shade, this is a great one because it's an understory tree. Not in the dense part of your woods if you have that, but, but along the edges. So it can take some shade and does well in shade. And of course it, it's blooming now. So it's blooming before the big trees get their leaves on them. And so it's getting plenty of sun for its, for its uh, blooming. But it's, it's great because it's one of the earliest flowering trees and consequently uh, the, the uh, bees and butterflies that are starting to come out have some source of nectar for themselves. Donny hawthorn is a great tree. If you're going to, if you have maples, focus on the sugar maple. 
there's a couple of maples that we don't want to have. And one of them is the Norway maple we'll talk about in a minute and, and or the silver maple. They just, they're so aggressive and they send shoots up the, the silver every, you know, if you have one of those, you know, you're cutting down shoots in your lawn every time. And, and there's a, this little smaller tree is a wild black cherry, but another neat one to have. Here are the ones not to plant or to cut down if you can. The Norway maple is pretty. This is a picture of it. But the problem is it gets so dense that nothing can grow under it. People say, what can I plant under my Norway maple? And we can say, only thing you can do is put mulch down because it is so dense, nothing else can grow under it. Uh, the Chinese elm is very invasive. They pop up all over the place. We lost most of our American elms. So the elms that are left around typically are the Chinese elm. These are all very aggressive. Uh, the tree of heaven, I didn't know this tree uh, years ago when we, I moved into this house. Uh, I was seeing little shoots coming up and they looked like sumac. There's a, it's a, you know, a, a leaf, leaflets, you know, like sumacs have. But they were popping up all over the place. And then I, I recognized, I, I identified the tree finally as, as a tree of heaven, the Olympus, and, and, and had it cut down. And I think that was the first time I've ever cut down a live tree, but, but it, it is so bad. It was, it was um, imported and used along roadways I think because you can't kill it. And so it probably lives fine with the salt and you know, all of the, the, the traffic uh, uh, congestion, and I'm not congestion, but the uh, tailpipe fumes and so forth. Uh, but, but it's very, very aggressive and it'll pop up everywhere. And the problem with the Bradful, Bradford or Calorie pears, I don't have a photo of them, but that is also an import. And they brought it in to plant it along uh, <clears throat> the right of ways and along the, the roads because it's got a very pretty white flowers in the spring. <clears throat> but the problem is that it escapes and it has gotten into the woods and so to the point that our native pears and, and prunes, a prunus genus, almost don't exist anymore. They have been, they've been uh, inundated by the, uh, the, the Bradford and calorie pears. So certainly don't plant one. And if you have one, if you can grin and bear it and cut it down, I would recommend you do that. And in terms of taking care of trees, don't make volcanoes around the base of the trees. I was just at Good Shepherd Hospital this morning. I'm, I have a wrist problem and I was working with an occupational therapist. So I drove through the grounds and they have a beautiful lawn, all pretty. And I don't know whether they're new little trees or, or just redone, but they all have mounds around them like this. And I just gritted my teeth. The problem is that the soil up around the base of the trunk like this rots the trunk and allows insects to get in. And sometimes this, the roots, instead of growing down, grow up because this soil is soft up around the tree. So put some mulch around it, but keep it level on, 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 the, on the ground. And also, if you can uh, shred your leaves, especially in the fall, and put them around the base of the tree, that's the best uh, mulch you can use because when the baby birds are hatching, uh, the fledglings are coming out in like now in this time of year, if they land on bare soil, they, the predators can get them. If they have a, a leaf mulch down there, they can hide or they can you know, get their bearings and, before they start to fly. And the same thing is true with caterpillars that uh, if they've come out of the uh, pupa or the cocoon stage and, and fall out, They'll, if they land on bare soil, they're, they're, uh, they don't make it. If they can, if they can have a, a mulch down there to, to snuggle down into, they can become butterflies or moths before they get eaten. Although the birds eat them, so it's good food for the birds too. And please don't use pesticides. We'll talk a little bit more about, about uh, buying plants, but some of the garden centers, particularly the big box stores, still sell plants that have a systemic, they, they, they advertise them as bug free. But if, if you're killing the bad bugs, you're also killing the good bugs. And the whole reason you're planting some of this is to support some of the good bugs. Okay, let's move quickly into shrubs. There's some beautiful native shrubs. This one is the high bush cranberry viburnum. 
with the big berries and the birds just absolutely love it. You can, you can actually make jam out of these berries, but usually the birds get them before you do. But I'm gonna start this with the things to get rid of. I mentioned the buckthorn taking over Lake County. It's taking over everywhere in Illinois. And we really have a major, major uh, campaign to, to get rid of it. There's nothing good about it. This in this picture is in the fall. This green blob is, is the buckthorn and the yellow, I don't know, is an ash or something up there, maybe a hickory. But the pro part of the problem with the buckthorn is that it, it is so dense and the leaves come out early, they're coming out now, and they stay after all the leaves are gone in the, in the woods, the buckthorn is still green. And it's so dense that nothing can grow under it, as well as the fact that it poisons the soil. And so between the two of them, it keeps everything else from growing. And it has berries on it that the birds try to eat, but they can't digest them, and so they go through them. In fact, that's why it's called cathartica, <laughs> because the berries, uh, you know, the, the birds poop the, the seeds all over the place, which helps them spread, but they spread also by their roots all over the place. So it's tough to get rid of, but you need to work at it. If you have any buckthorn on your property at all, uh, it does need to be, well, if they're little shoots, you can pull them at this time of year, but, but usually when, they're, when they get to be a big shrub like this, they have to be cut and every stem has to be cut and, and herbicided. We recommend rather than a spray herbicide though, that you use, uh, if you, you, you know, put it in a cup or a bucket and use a little paintbrush and paint it right on the stump so that you're not killing other things around it. Another bad one is the honeysuckle. This is the, uh, there are good honeysuckles, but, but this one is the uh, most invasive, again, really tough to get rid of. It has gnarly, uh, branches that go every which way. And if you prune a little bit, it just goes, goes off in another direction. Uh, so you, you have to herbicide this one too. We don't recommend herbiciding a lot, but these are two that really need it because if you just cut it and don't herbicide it, you'll get a thousand more shoots next year. So given that there are some great shrubs and we, we need to look at different kinds of shrubs because some of them provide structural diversity as well as the, the, the berries or the pollen. There are species of birds like the wood thrush that nest only in dense thickets. And so if you want to attract some, uh, you need to have denser ones. Also the denser ones are cover. If you have, I have some right behind a bird uh, feeder so that the birds sometimes will take the seeds and then rush back into the bush to sit so that they aren't uh, prey for the hawks that I have flying around. In addition, the juncos and chickadees use them in general for protection from hawks. So they're multiple services. Here are some of the dense ones. The black high viburnum, if you're, if you're taking down a bunch of, of buckthorn, this is a really good replacement for it. If it's a screen or an edging or you know a hedge kind of thing, the black high viburnum is a great one. Uh, and, and the high bush cranberry as well. High bush cranberry likes to be a little wetter. The, the black hawk can be just about anywhere. I'll just give a caveat though. If you're just looking for, for viburnums now, pay attention to, there's a, there's a new uh, disease uh, it, it called uh, the actually bug, the viburnum borer uh, that has been killing viburnums and only viburnums. It doesn't get on the rest of the shrubs. I've lost a bunch of them to it. Um, I, I contacted the Botanic Garden to see, I mean, the uh, Morton Arboretum to see what they recommended about it. And, and they said, the only thing you can do is clip the branches that, that have the borer on it. You can look at a branch and if you see little tiny brown bumps, that's the borer. And, and you see the holes in the leaves. So you know that there is. I, I worked at it for two years, kept clipping branch after branch and, and lost basically lost them. The only ones I have that the, the viburnum that survived are the maple leaf viburnum and the nanny berry. They somehow missed it, but, but, the, but my high bush cranberries died. Anyway, moving on uh, to the service berry is another lovely, lovely shrub, beautiful flowers. It's blooming right now. And then they get berries on it and, and the birds <clears throat> love those as well. And another one like that, and, and it's big, uh, is, a, is the nine barker, it can get big. So there's some great uh, uh, replacements if you're getting rid of the honeysuckle and the buckthorn. And here are some 
taller shrubs that you might be interested in. The black chokeberry doesn't get as thick around as the uh, viburnums do, but is a, a, a beautiful flower and with berries. Pagoda dogwoods are great for shade. Most of these like to have some sun, but the, but the pagoda dogwood is just a lovely, uh, there's other dogwoods as well, but that one is, gets bigger, taller and spreads nicely. Here's the nanny berry that I said, uh, mine didn't, didn't get the uh, viburnum borer on it. So uh, I'm hoping that it'll, that'll run its course and be gone after uh, this year or so, but, but I'll just alert to that. Um, here's a maple leaf viburnum loaded with flowers in the spring. And then that turns in and, and the viburnum itself, the, the leaves turn bright scarlet in the fall. So you get the beauty out of it as well as helping the critters. Elderberry is a little different. It, it grows very fast um, and, the, uh, and a little bit bigger uh, spread out, not thick so much as, as wide. You may have seen these, you, you may have some of these there. They grow very easily. Uh, and, and I have some that, you know, re receded. So I've had a couple of them mo volunteer and come in on them, their own. But again, and you can make jam out of those berries. But again, it's the issue of do the, the birds love it so much that maybe they'll get it before you do. Here are some smaller shrubs that are interesting. As I mentioned, I, I have so much shade, I keep pushing the limits to see what I can get that really wants more sun. And I tried it with a hazelnut and it doesn't like the shade. It didn't get berries, uh, the nuts on it at all. So that one's for sun, but it gets to be, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 inches, 50 inches max tall. Uh, the sumac, this one is a, the, the, the dwarf sumac and obviously beautiful, beautiful uh, fall color. Uh, but also it has the, the berries on, or the, the, the flower stalk that, that uh, is edible by the critters. Most people don't know about the shrubby St. John's wort. There's a, there's a uh, forb St. John's wort as well, but, but this one is the, is the bush version uh, and full sun, but again, uh, just a bee magnet. Now here's the gray dogwood. This is great for the shade. It, it, uh, it's a native, I, I just have them coming up in my woods all over the place, but lovely, doesn't get as tall as the pagoda dogwood, but uh, has the berry, it has little flowers that are a little bit insignificant in the spring, but then these great berries that, that the, the birds love. And the New Jersey tea is a, is a unique one. It's little by comparison. It, it maybe gets to be maximum two feet tall and a nice clump and it's very conservative. So it stays put. It's not gonna, you're not gonna find it, you know, receding everywhere. Uh, but again, the bees love the flowers of that one. So just a, a comment about pruning, let natives be natural. If you're pruning for dead branches, that's fine. But, but the idea of, you know, trying to make them into a different shape, these aren't natives. I think these are ewes in my neighbor's yard, but, but you know, what, what purpose is served by making little boxes out of them? or bowling balls as some people do. Uh, I had, it was on a, a garden tour of England a few years ago and, and uh, some of the formal gardens there, they have whole hedges usually use that are pruned flat. And it just, yeah, it makes a nice room outside, but it, you, you're down to the stubby branches instead of the new growth every year. It just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Okay, moving on. An area I call front yard landscaping. And the reason I do is because there are some native plants that really do better in a front yard. They don't get big, tall and weedy looking, or they, you know, they, in the case of these black eyed Susans and, and uh, purple cone flowers, they obviously spread to fill up the space. But one of the issues in the front, in, in having native plants in front yards that, that don't, uh, get opposed by your uh, homeowners association or your neighbors is paying attention to some of the design elements that you'd have in a regular garden in the front yard. Um, the height of the plants, uh, there are, there are well-behaved natives. There are some that are very uh, prolif prolific, but others that are well-behaved and, and putting edges. So here you have, for example, a path and a distinctive edge around the ground cover and some the, the native plants in, in the foreground. 
ordinarily I would say don't put tall ones in the front yard, but in this case, because it's a long driveway, this is in Barrington Hills, they've got the uh, purple uh, Joe Pie here, but you've got an edge, you've got lower plants, a little bit higher plants, and then the tallest ones in the back. So if you're using good design elements around it, you can get by with uh, things that other people might say are a little bit not tidy enough for your front yard. But here are some that are very well behaved and lovely, lovely landscape plants. This butterfly weed is a milkweed. All of the Asclepias are, are milkweeds. Uh, stays in a nice clump, a little bit uh, conservative. It's not, it's not going to spread much. It'll, the, the clump will get larger, but it's not going to bounce to lots of other areas like some of the other milkweed do. I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, the wild white indigo, the, 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 the plant itself looks like a shrub. It gets to be maybe um, 36, 40 inches tall, maybe even, maybe even four feet. Um, so it looks like a shrub and it's got these spectacular tall stalks of, of white flowers on it that the bees absolutely swarm over. It's not a shrub though, because it dies back each year. In fact, when it's coming up right now, it looks like little asparagus spears coming out of the ground, but then it grows fast and it gets these. A warning though, I have deer. And if you have deer, the deer love the flowers. And so I go out as soon as the buds come out and spray it with deer often. I've been able to, to, to salvage them that way. You know, the purple cone flower, of course, that's a great one. Uh, it does spread uh, well, uh, but not, so aggressively that it's going to come up in your lawn or anything. Uh, the blazing stars, this one's the rough blazing star and it, it gets a little taller, but in a clump, it's, you don't just put one of them in. If you have several of them, they kind of stand together and they're very showy. And again, the, the, the bees and the butterflies just absolutely go after those. And the, there's a lot of things called bee balm, but the, this Monarda, the bergamot is uh, the native one. And it too is just full, it, full of, of pollen and the, uh, it has multiple uh, flowers on, uh, uh, you know, it, it, there's clumps. So it's beautiful, but it's also attractive to lots of uh, pollinators because it's, there's, there's just a lot of pollen there. Here's some other ones that are good for the sun. If you want red, white, and blue, you can do the great, the great blue lobelia, the royal catchfly, and the culver's root, and you've got your colors. The, uh, this lobelia likes to be a little bit wet, doesn't have to be in, in, in what doesn't, won't, doesn't need to be in water, uh, but, it, but it's good for a rain garden if you have a little wet spot that is fine when it's wet some of the time and dry some of the time. I have it along my stream and in my rain garden. And uh, you know, the, like right now, everything's dry and, and uh, it's coming up just fine. The obedient plant, I'm starting to call disobedient plant. It is very aggressive, it spreads a lot. But if you have a spot, I had it in my little bit of prairie in my sunny spot and it was just taking over. So I, I moved it over to along the road edge and, and it just, where it could just spread and it wasn't infringing on other things and it likes that. So if you have a big area to fill in or a, an open area you want, uh, it, it's a very pretty plant. It's just very aggressive. You know, the brown-eyed Susans, of course, um, and black-eyed Susans and brown-eyed Susans. The, the, uh, the brown, I think that the, I should have this straight. One of them is, is a biannual, but, but they seed themselves. So you don't know whether it's the same plant coming up or, or the new seeding coming up. Make, make a nice clump like that original photo I had. And this royal catchfly, some of you may know about the cardinal flower, which is a lobelia, like the great blue lobelia, but, but this one is not as uh, finicky. This royal catchfly, uh, is just as pretty and it, it is, uh, whoops, spreads uh, slowly, you know, makes a nice clump and a, and a beautiful landscape plant. And then here's the culverus root, uh, which is, is, you know, a, a distinctive kind of a shape and, and, and uh, color. The, um, all, all, the, the pollinators love all of these. That's why I'm including them here. There's also lots of lots of other possible plants, but I, I'm just picking these out for you. Now you might just want some for shade that stay nice behaved landscape plants. 
there's a white baneberry as well, but the red baneberry I think is just so showy. It's lovely. It doesn't, the flowers are a little insignificant, but it gets these beautiful clumps of red berries. The wild columbine uh, is one that the hummingbirds like because they love any cone shape, you know, where they can get the proboscis right up into the, into the, the, uh, the pollen's out here, but the nectar is stuck up in the cones. So that's a great one. These all love shade. The bluebells are blooming right now and are just gorgeous. It's interesting, we had such warm weather for a while that everything came out early, but now that it's cool, they're lasting a long time. They're not dying back so soon. So that's a great one. Uh, the woodland phlox is one of my favorite uh, because it, it comes up and lasts, it, it, the blooms last about a month. Some of these are, are you know, go, like the bluebells will die back and be gone completely. Whereas the, the flocks, the flowers last a longer time and then the leaves stay out for the summer. So you don't have a bare spot where they were. And, and they're quite showy. Some of the spring plants are so are low to the ground and you can't see them from a distance, but the flocks get to be about six to eight inches tall. And so they're great. And the native geranium is another one that um, is, blooms a little along about the same time, but, but maybe a little bit later. Sun or shade, it doesn't care. It's happy in both places. And there are some well-behaved grasses. This a prairie drop seed is the best landscape grass. It's, it makes a nice clump, uh, about maybe about 24 inches across, uh, doesn't, doesn't spread all over the place. In fact, it's so conservative that for, as a restor for a restoration plant at Citizens for Conservation, we, we have to pick the seed and, and, and plant the seed in a nursery to get more plants to grow because it, otherwise it gets out competed in the prairie but great for a landscape plant, beautiful. The reason it's called drop seed is because these little, little uh, uh, seed heads bend themselves back and, and apparently you know, drop the seeds out and around the edges. Recommend that for a garden. And the little blue stem is another one uh, that's great for that. It is, um, stays in a clump, gets to be maybe three feet tall max usually not even that tall. And this is the fall color. I don't know why it's called blue stem. I haven't been able to find that. It's really a red stem. And all these little white fluffy things are the seed packages on there. And the chickadees will go after that like crazy. The side oats grama is another one. Uh, it's, it's not as clumpy as the blue stem. So this would be more likely to be uh, used in, in, a, in a bigger space. I saw a wonderful landscaping at a corporate headquarters uh, where, where along the sidewalk, they had a whole patch of side oaks grama and it's so pretty in the fall. Can't really see it in this picture, but the seeds are all on one side of the stem and they flutter in the, in the breeze. And of course, seed eaters go after them. So I'm gonna move along quickly here. Now, there are some other natives for habitat that I would not recommend for the front yard unless as that, that driveway I showed you had some space for tall things. The pur purple giant hyssop is a great uh, attractor of, of pollinators, <clears throat> but it gets to be six feet or more tall. And, and so, you know, probably you wouldn't have it right by your front door. I may be making too many assumptions about your front yard, but <laughs> ordinarily, they we don't. The, the, uh, the butterfly weed that I showed you is the, the best behaved of the milkweeds. <clears throat> this uh, is, is common milkweed the kind that used to grow along the roadsides until the farmers used Roundup to kill everything other than their soybeans. <clears throat> and that's part of what caused the, the, uh, the problem for the monarchs because they, they need it in the spring and they also need it in the fall for the, for, <clears throat> for the, uh, the nectar, for their fatten up for their long flights back. But it, it pops up here and there, it'll spread itself around. <clears throat> it, it transplants pretty easily, although it has a deep root. Um, but, but it, you know, if you have a patch where you just want some things to, to get tall and, and, and look pretty, you can put that in. The Coreopsis is another one that gets quite tall, uh, but, but it's, it, it's, it's a prairie plant, but it can be certainly be used in a, in a backyard as well. Another one that's an interesting is the Rattlesnake Master. Uh, it, its seed head is a, is, a, is a ball of spikes. You know, if you're gonna pick up, you always have to have gloves on, but, but the birds go after those like crazy. So that's a great one. And the purple Joe pieweed, uh, again, 
pollinators love it. It's, it and, and they like the fact that there's this clump of flowers. It's not a single flower, it's bunches of them. Same thing is true with several of these, you know, that there's a clump of them that attracts them. But it does get quite tall and it does spread quite a lot. So I have it far back. The, 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 uh, there's a spotted joe pie and the purple joe pie. The spotted joe pie grows better in the shade, uh, the purple in the sun, but they both have similar characteristics. Okay, let's quickly, we've been talking about the pollinators. This is showy goldenrod and the bees, you can see the bees on it. Uh, a good thing to have because it blooms much later than some of the summer ones. But let's talk about the butterflies and moths. Various kinds of milkweeds, pick, pick them for the kind of environment you have. There is a swamp milkweed that doesn't need a swamp but does like to be wetter. There's a bunch of them. <clears throat> um, this is the milkweed caterpillar on the milkweed pods. <clears throat> In after, after the flowers are, are gone, I mean, after they, the, there's seeds in there. Kids love to pick the seeds and because uh, they have the little silk uh, wings on them that can blow them around. Um, but there's a bunch of different milkweeds. Uh, the swallowtails love plants in the carrot family. And so the, the meadow rue is one of the, of the native plants. I leave the Queen Anne's lace in my little prairie area in the summer because it, it's in the carrot family and the swallowtails like it. <clears throat> if you're a vegetable garden and you, you have actually have carrots in there, you might find some swallowtails coming in there as well. Lots of different plants possible for the for summer. Nectar plants <clears throat> particularly. So the, the, uh, all of the, the butterflies and moths will go after them. And then as I showed you the goldenrod earlier, the, the fall blooming plants for the migrating monarchs so they can get uh, their pollen. So it's not, if you're planting milkweed in the spring, you wanna make sure you're attracting the monarchs to, to lay their eggs. You wanna make sure you have uh, blooming plants in the fall too. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Bumblebees love the, the multi, multi flower. They'll buzz from one to the next, to the next, to the next. You could stand there and watch them. This is a rusty patched bumblebee, which is an endangered species in Northern Illinois. This photo was taken by one of Citizens for Conservation's interns at our prairie. And they had it that you, you have to, you know, take a photograph and, and send it in to be, to be uh, officially acknowledged that it is a rusty patch. So they are not gone. You build, put the, put the right environment in and, and you'll get these good guys. Some other ones, I mentioned the Monada before, the golden rods, blazing stars. I, we, I was doing a program once and somebody said, I don't want to attract bees because they sting. And that's, that's a myth. Bumblebees, which are the native bees, and there's a bunch of different kinds of native bees, don't sting. They're pretty much solitary bees. If, if, you, if you tried to squeeze one, yes, it would sting you, but it's the honeybees that are the non-native, but the you know the ones that are used commercially uh, to to uh, pollinate the almond trees in California and and all the tomatoes and so forth. Uh, they they do if you if you get close enough. But there none of them are like the yellow jackets or the wasps that'll come after you. You know that will will swarm out of wherever their round hole is and and come after you. But the but the but don't be afraid of the bees. You can get up pretty close and be able to take a photo like this and not have them bother you. Do you know about ants as pollinators? They are actually second only to bees as pollinators. Um, and, and if you have carpenter ants, I know we don't like them in our house, but the woodpeckers do eat them. So <laughs> one possible part of the ecosystem. But let me tell you the story about bloodroot. It comes up early, early in the spring it's a beautiful plant. The leaves, the, pet, the flowers don't last very long. A heavy rain will knock the petals off. But I had a big clump way back in the back of my yard. And, and then I was finding little ones coming up here and there. And I was happy about that because I don't, you know, early in the spring, I'm not necessarily back in the, in the far corners. And I wondered how they got there because their seed is too big to be wind blown. And then I learned about ants. The seed of the blood root is, is a, it's about a half inch, maybe, a quarter inch long, uh, but, it, but it's actually has a pulp around the seed itself. And the pulp is called the ileosome. And the ants love to eat the ileosome. So they'll take the seed, eat that pulp, and drop the seed wherever they happen to be. And that is what gets them moving around. 
So they do transplant beautifully. So if you happen to find one and it's not where you want it to be, you can always move it around. Uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. The dragonflies and, and damselflies are wonderful if you have them. It's an indicator of non-polluted water. They need to have water uh, to, they, 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 they lay their eggs in the water and the nymphs come out of the water, but they aren't, they aren't flies yet. They don't have wings yet. And so they need a plant along the water edge to climb out of. And so if you have black plastic on a pond, or if you just have grass coming up to the edge, uh, or even just mud, the dragonfly, they'll die. They can't get out, or they probably won't lay their eggs there in the first place. Maybe they're smart enough not to, but, but they need to have a plant along the water's edge, like a, like a blue flag iris or something that they can climb up on. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. And don't use pesticides if you can. I, I can't think of, I guess maybe the only time I ever used a pesticide is in a wasp nest when it was right under my sidewalk by my front door and I didn't want people to get stung when they were coming. But they kill, they, they kill good bugs as well as bad bugs and, and don't buy the pest free plants, the ones that are, have systemic pesticides in them. So anything that eats them will die or takes their pollen. So that's the message there. Now quickly, let's get into the birds. This is a um, bobolink in our, on, a, on a milkweed in, in our uh, Grigsby Prairie in, uh, in Barrington. Some of these photos, by the way, all of these bird photos have been taken by Steve Barton, who is a, just a spectacular photographer. And in fact, I mentioned that the 50 ways this, this program is on the CFC website. Steve did a program for us in February called If You Build It, They Will Come about backyard habitat. And, and uh, so you can see his spectacular photos on, on the Citizens for Conservation website as well. Um, different kind of habitats. We aren't likely to have bluebirds in our yards unless you have some open prairie. They are an indicator of a good prairie. You know, they're, they're, they're fussy about where they, they live. The woodpeckers, of course, want, want wood, but they, if they have a snag or a brush pile, isn't this a wonderful photo of a, a red-bellied woodpecker poking out of, a, of a, the, the nest that he built in that, in that snag? And not all wrens, but sedge wrens prefer sedges. So if you're going to, you want to attract them. And by the way, in that Doug, Doug Tallamy that I quoted at the beginning uh, has a book called, uh, Bringing Nature Home. He's got several books since then, but that was what the first one. And if you want to know which species of bird or butterfly or bee want which kind of plants, that's the book for you to look at. It's, uh, you, can, you can look it up by woodpeckers and he'll say, these are the kind of plants they want or by, you know, whichever. Um, and, and of course, thrushes and catbirds prefer thickets. So there are different kinds of seasonal needs. If you're building uh, habitat, you wanna be paying attention to it all seasons, actually. In the spring, migrating birds need fuel, which can be berries or seeds if left over, uh, and they need shelter, both in the spring and the fall. And shelter can be some of those uh, shrubby shrubs that I was talking about. Uh, it can be evergreens that are, that are, you know, branches all year. Nesting birds need twigs. If you have a pristine yard and everything is raked up and there's no leftover grasses or twigs or branches or anything, the nesting birds won't, won't be able to build a nest there. And they need insects for their babies. So if you, if you have a, Somebody coming in to kill the mosquitoes, they're killing the rest of the insects too. And the uh, it, baby birds mostly don't eat, don't eat uh, nuts or seeds. They need insects. There's a few couple species that, that don't, but, but those do. And as I mentioned, the fledglings out of the nest need ground cover under the trees or shrubs. 
Hummingbirds, of course, need lots of sources of nectar. You can have your hummingbird feeder out, but they're really happy if you've got lots of plants for them. And winter birds need nuts. You can have your bird feeders with seeds in them, of course, but uh, they also need places to stash food and shelter. So if everything is neat and tidy, you are gonna be in trouble. Here's another one of Steve Barton's photos. Isn't that magnificent of the cedar waxwing with the berry? These are ones that, uh, there's birds that want berries. There's lots of others as well. But here are some of the, the shrubs. I've talked about the service berry that's blooming now with the nice white flowers on it. Uh, winter berry, I'll show a picture of it in a little bit. Uh, black choke berries got, the dogwoods have berries, the elderberries have berries. So all of those, and there's lots of other berry bushes. That, anything but the buckthorn that the, the birds like. Here is a hummingbird on that uh, royal catchfly that I mentioned earlier. Um, they, 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 there's a number of plants that they will go after. The virgin's bower is a vine that grows in part shade. Um, and it, it's, it's a clematis, it's the only native clematis, uh, but has lots of flower, masses of flowers on it later in the summer and the hummingbirds like that. Don't know if you know the nodding wild onion. This is not garlic must, it, you know, uh, in the garlic family, this is a allium and, and it has a, a, a flower with, that hangs down. I don't have a photo of it, but uh, lots of places for the birds that want them the nectar, the wild columbine I mentioned that has, you know, the kind of cone-shaped flower, most tube-shaped flowers that the hummingbirds are, are happy with. This uh, chart is, uh, you can find this kind of information in the uh, National Wildlife Federation has this, these kinds of uh, resources. What kind of seeds feed which kinds of species? And this is another one that, uh, you know, you might not be able to if you, if you want this information, you can look on the on this video and copy it down later, or or go to the National Wildlife Federation. You might be able to just print it out. So so um, the suet, the chickadees like it, the nuthatches, the uh, woodpeckers, of course. If you want trying to keep the woodpeckers from pecking your house, get them some suet out there. And of course, we've been talking about the ones with the with the fruit and the berries and the nectar but don't let your cat outside. My cat loves to sit on my, my uh, deck doors. I can open the, the, the storm door and just leave the screen door open and he'll just sit and just look at the world. I call it cat TV. And he's very happy just looking at the squirrels running around on the deck and <laughs> doesn't want to go out and I'm happy about that. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about all, all season long. Uh, this, by the way, this golden tree in the middle is, is a, uh, a bitter nut hickory. So that's the kind of gold color that you get. It's my backyard. But in the spring, there's lots of uh, plants. I talked about a few earlier, but the shooting stars, by the way, are blooming right now in, well, in, in the sun they're blooming. Mine are getting started, getting ready to, but a spring flower. Uh, the Jacob's Ladder is a wonderful uh, kind of almost a ground cover, but it's also a nice little clump of plant. It stays low, spreads a lot, and can just really fill in nicely. If you're, if you're looking to put something under trees rather than grass, a Jacob's Ladder makes a nice understory thing. And I showed you the woodland flocks earlier. And this is prairie smoke. Um, it, it is now the native Illinois uh, state flower. Um, years ago, it was a marigold and enough native plants specialists complained that that's not a native to Illinois, but the prairie smoke is. It, it stays little, These are, this is it blooming. And then when it goes to seed, it has a little, little loose, fluffy, little, little puff ball above it. And that's where the, the smoke concept comes from. So that's, those are some great spring ones. Here's some summer ones. Uh, there's lots of sunflowers, but the Western sunflower, this gets pretty tall as most of them do, uh, but you can just see the availability of the, of the pollen right there. Um, I mentioned the, 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 uh, the liatris, there's several of them. I had the rough uh, blazing star before. This is considered the marsh gay fe feather. There's your bee biking it. The swallowtail I mentioned earlier and the, and the red milkweed 
or any of the milkweeds actually are fine. In the fall, here is one that you might know, but is and it's a very conservative. Can you see the the uh, Katie did on it here? <laughs> it kind of blends in. It's a prairie gentian, very conservative. You need just the right kind of a, an area for it to grow, but oh, it is just a, a a beautiful plant, and and it blooms much later than most of the others. So it, it's blooming in late August and September. Same thing is true with the goldenrods. And don't let the um, the myth about goldenrod causing hay fever uh, get you because it, the problem is it blooms at the same time as ragweed gets, it, it spreads its pollen. And so people used to think that it was the goldenrods that were causing the hay fever. And I know, cause I'm very allergic to ragweed but I am not allergic to my goldenrods. So that's a good one for the fall. Woodland sunflowers. This is one, they, the, these both want sun, whereas the woodland sunflowers grow in the woods and they just sprinkle themselves around. They're pretty aggressive in terms of, you know, they'll, they'll pop up here and there and they spread by runners, but you can just literally pull, pull easily pull them. Their roots are right close to the surface if, if they're getting in the way. But very nice to be able to have them blooming in September. And the heath, any of the asters actually, this is a heath aster are great plants to have. You should have a goldenrod and an aster at least in your yard. They get nice clumps of them and will, will help with the uh, habitat in the fall. And then there's winter. A <clears throat> good idea if you have the, this is the pale purple coneflowers, but the, but, the, but the regular purple coneflowers also have a nice big seed head like this and they feed lots of birds in the fall. So <clears throat> leave them up. It might look a little messy, but leave them there for them. This isn't a particularly good photo of the white pine, but of course it has the pine cones, which <clears throat> feed birds all winter. And the acorns from oaks, <clears throat> these are acorns, but there are hickory, walnut, and hazelnuts that also uh, are, are winter food, <clears throat> excuse me, for the birds. And here's a picture of the winter berry I mentioned earlier. It's a beautiful shrub <clears throat> with these red berries on it all the way through the winter until, well, they, they stay until the birds get them all. So those are some possibilities. Need to real quickly talk about water. However you have it, <clears throat> you, if, you have a, if you're on a, a pond or an, a lake uh, water, this is a friend of mine has this place in, in, on Honey Lake and this is her lawn and then it comes into the, the, the native plants planted in here. And then this is Honey Lake that's all green in, the, in late summer unfortunately, because everybody fertilizes their lawns and that washes into the pond and into the lake. But she has all sorts of critters living in here, frogs and toads and salamanders and I don't know what all. Uh, and, and her neighbor over here has nothing but the dark swath of buckthorn. So nice buffer between the, the lawn and the water. This is my next door neighbor. We have a little stream that runs across our front yards. And when I moved in, they had nothing but cement blocks, just as ugly as sin on both sides of the stream to hold it in. And I had those taken out and I tapered the hills and put native plants with deep roots on them. And they're going doing just fine. This is my neighbors who instead of planting plants, she put the rocks up here, presumably to, you know, to, to block it. But we had a seven inch rain a couple of years. In fact, we had another one last summer and it just washed out the soil out from under the rocks. So now the rocks are down in the stream and this bank is just continues to erode. So rocks don't work well. Rip wrap, I mean, if you, if you have a, a, a stream edge, you know, the, the, the rip wrap is pretty ugly and it doesn't have any natural value at all. So uh, think about getting native plants in instead. Uh, this is Phragmites, one of the very invasive uh, wetland plants that if, if you drive by any wetland area today, you'll see masses of this. It just completely fills it in. And not only does it, I mean, it doesn't have much, it, it's so dense that nothing, you know, can, can survive down in it, but it, it also fills in the water. So the, so the migrating uh, waterfowl can't, can't land there. I mean, there's, they, they can't even see any water there. It, it is that aggressive. It's really tough to get rid of though. If you have it, if you're up against a wetland and you, you know it's out there, you pretty much have to get professional help. There are, there are companies that, that have the equipment to go out and the herbicide they use on it, uh, is the kind that doesn't mix with the water. So it's not going to kill other things in there. Um, 
But the critters that live in ponds and streams need shelter, food, and clean water. Uh, and you have to have open water to attract the water birds. And, and as I mentioned earlier, dragonflies must have water for the nymphs to have. And if you have dragonflies, it says you have good water because they won't live in dirty water. Okay. Another way to deal with water is rain gardens. I don't know if you can tell, but there's, there's water along the base of these plants. And uh, this is a marsh marigold that is, loves to be with its feet in the water or along the edge, or the blue flag iris, great ones. The, a rain garden is, is an area that is likely to be wet some of the time, but not all of the time. So if we've had a lot of rain in the spring, not this year, but most years, it, if you have a wet spot in your yard, grass doesn't want to be there, put in a rain garden. And in addition to dealing with the water and holding it in place rather than having it run off, uh, it provides you know, all the, the uh, materials that the critters need. So you're, you're, you're adding more habitat that way and getting the water to go back into the soil rather than running off. So the birds need water too. So a bird bath is good. It needs to be changed regularly. Uh, or a winter one. This is a friend of mine. She had, it, it, it's connected, you know, got an electric cord to, just to keep it uh, heated, a little heater in there. And uh, this is on the ground. You could put it on a deck or someplace else to, to, to provide some water in the winter for the birds. Real quickly, I want to cover ground covers and mulch. My preferred ground covers are plants, but a uh, good idea if you possibly can to get a, a composter, or in my case, I have a, a, a screened in space behind my shed for my compost pile. Uh, it gets the leaves in the, in, uh, usually the shredded oak leaves because they don't decompose fast enough and, and grass seed in the summer, grasses in the summer. And I put vegetable scraps and so forth in it. Um, but if you're going using ground cover for habitat, it's protection, as I mentioned, for the larva. It's a shelter for the fledglings, and it provides seeds in the fall and winter. And in addition to the, these shelters, it's also, uh, you know, only the, only the monarchs are the, are the butterflies that migrate that far. Most of the butterflies lay their nests in the ground cover here in the winter and then, and then hatch out in the spring. That's, that's the way they can survive our winters. So there's some good plants to use as ground covers. The wild ginger is super. It has a, there's flowers underneath, so you don't plant it for the flower, but, it, but it's really a lovely uh, ground cover plant. There's sedges. Uh, some of them get a little taller, some are shorter, but they fill in spaces. Um, if you have English ivy, get rid of it and instead encourage or plant the Virginia cre creeper, also called woodbine. Gets this lovely color in the fall and uh, is a is good shelter for critters. Uh, the ferns, this is a maidenhair fern, which is my favorite, uh, and there's lots of other ferns. This one stays a little shorter. Most of them are, are a little taller and you might not consider them a ground cover unless you're wanting to fill in a space that used to be grass and you just want a big, you know, good, a good space that's got plants in it. And the Virginia water leaf is a lovely one. It's very, it spreads a lot. You don't put it as a specimen plant someplace, uh, but it has these lovely flowers in the spring that the birds and, and, and pollinators love uh, and, and spreads enough to be a, a good ground cover, a fill. Some that, by the way, those were all for sh shade. Some of the sun shade, uh, ground covers for sun. Uh, there are some sedges uh, that, that work well. The sand flocks, I don't know uh, if, if you have a, a dry area, it doesn't have to be sand, but, but dry. Um, the beautiful, it spreads and makes a nice mat, very showy, very nice. And this purple love grass doesn't get tall. It, it, it's, uh, oops, I don't mean to be doing that, sorry. Um, stays, I don't know, six, eight inches tall and fill, fills in nicely. So about mulch, don't buy cedar mulch. I, it just, I just cry to think they're cutting down great cedar trees just to make mulch out of it. Well, they use the wood for the lawn furniture as well because it doesn't get rot. But, uh, and, and there's no value in dyed mulch. The best mulch is leaves, but if you're going to purchase mulch, look for the coconut coir. There literally are coconut husks chopped up. And so it's, it's not, you're not cutting trees down to, to make it, which is the issue with those. I'm going quickly because our time is 
getting very close. Real quickly, a little bit about critters. I've been talking about them. Um, if you have water, you want to have some amphibians or turtles. Um, I have learned that possums are, are vegetarians and raccoons are, uh, oops, I'm losing the word, but eat anything. <laughs> Um, I, I was blaming deer for eating some of my, my flowers and it turns out they're possums, but they, they belong here. I don't happen to have rabbits and I'm not quite sure why, maybe because I live next to the forest preserve and the coyotes get them or something. Um, don't fuss about spiders outside. Uh, I know you don't like them inside, but, but the birds do eat them and they, they're good for them. And, oh, and, and I mentioned earlier the ants. If you have anthills in your yard, don't kill them. If you have them in your house, you can do what you need to. But, but outside, if, you know, just, just let them be. They do more good than harm. Don't do any harm outside. And the fireflies, you know, remember years ago, we'd see firefly, fireflies a lot. I've discovered that they have to have leaf litter to, to hatch in, you know, whatever flies do. So if you don't have, you know, if you have a, a neat yard or all your whole neighborhood has neat grass and, and you know, mulched beds and no, nothing littery around, uh, you won't have fireflies. This deer, by the way, is in my woods looking at me saying, nah, 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 I dare you to chase me away. There are some bad bugs, but the good news is that flickers and grackles eat the Japanese beetles. Uh, the grubs, robins, all, all the, the ground birds eat them. And uh, if you're using a, a, a herbicide, I mean, a pesticide to kill the grubs, you, the birds or whoever gets them are gonna die. So please don't do that. Uh, the gypsy moths, you know, are the big, big uh, cocoon kind of things hanging on the branches. I haven't seen too many lately. Uh, and then I mentioned the varburnum borer that we haven't found a solution for yet other than cutting the, the leaves off. Just finally, some earth-friendly practices. This is a, a, the bird feeders are here. This is a suet feeder that you can't see too well. But as I mentioned, the birds will come get the seeds and then go back into the shrubs in the background to, uh, to eat them to be protected, I guess. Um, if you have a lot of turf, turf grass, maybe a, a starting point is to start cutting bigger circles around your trees so that you, you're not getting rid of the, all the grass, but you're expanding the amount of area for habitat. Grass isn't habitat. It doesn't serve any purpose for anything except the grubs, uh, which then feed the birds. But, but you know, th th there's no habitat value in it. Instead, under a tree, put some of the, uh, the ground covers I mentioned. This is Golden Alexander over here. Um, I think this is the flocks and the um, Virginia, what did I just talk about? Water leaf right in there. Anyway, all sorts of combinations you can put under a tree. And as I mentioned, don't mound the soil like that. So leave the, leave the leaves on the ground in the fall, not on your grass perhaps, but certainly under the trees. And if you can leave them whole, do that because they're more valuable. Lots of critters are gonna survive through the winter on them. Leave snags and brush if you can. If it's not a tree that a dead tree that's gonna you know, threaten your house, if you can put one in, the, in that, <coughs> things will live in that. Um, the elderberry stems, if you, you may know it, are, are hollow and uh, butterflies, bees, Lots of critters live in those in the winter. And if you have dead stalks of your monarda or your, which is your, your bee balm or uh, the uh, coneflowers, all sorts of things have stalks. You leave the, the seed heads on them for the birds, but you also leave the stalks for other things to live in. And the finches will go after those seed heads as long as there's a seed in it. Tiny little seeds, you think they're empty, but the finches will still be eating them. So it's good to have a messy yard in the winter. So try not ever to use pesticide. Use herbicide very sparingly and only on the really, really aggressive bad stuff that I mentioned, the buckthorn and the honeysuckle. And recognize that native plants don't need or want fertilizer. 
just don't need to bother with it and, and, and put that much more chemical in the, in, the, in the yard. So one last thing, light pollution. The main cause for the loss of insect species, especially moths, is night light. It not only, it disorients the birds too. It, you know, I don't know if you know about, there's a group of people that, that uh, go walk the streets of, of uh, the city of Chicago around the, the high rises, like on Sunday morning to see if they can catch, especially now in migrating season, if birds have hit the, the windows because there's lights on, and then uh, sometimes they're, they're dead, but sometimes they can catch them injured and, and, and uh, rescue them. Uh, so if you need lights outside, use motion lights for the security purposes or yellow LEDs, which don't bother the birds as well. This is what we don't want. That's, you know, yeah, whoops. It, it shows the house off, but it's not serving habitat purposes at all. And it may in fact be detracting from some of the good habitat. So enjoy your yard year round. We, you can make a difference, even if you just do a little bit of the 50 things I recommended, you're making a difference. And we're trying together to get more and more and more yards connected and, and in, in, a, in a close enough area that they make a, a corridor. So if in fact, one yard isn't enough for some of the species that want more space, several yards might be. So you might convince your, your neighbors as well. This is, the front photo was my front yard and this photo is my backyard with my ginger all the way along the walk here. There we go. I would just give credit for some of the photos. They're all locally taken, these folks. And my friend Wayne Schild helped me. I had all the content and he made things move and made it pretty and whatnot. Now here are the resources I mentioned. Uh, citizensforconservation.org is the website. <clears throat> and there's a, a button called native plants. And if you want more information about lots of different native plants, some of which I mentioned here, but lots of others, you can go in and it tells you the kind of uh, ecology they need, how much water, what, how much sun, how big they get, what, you know, what they, they have good photos of them. So that's a great resource. <clears throat> Our native plant sale is over for this year. Uh, we're only doing pre-orders uh, because of uh, we, the, the during, um, Good Shepherd Hospital in Barrington lets us use their barn area for, for our sale, but we can't use the parking lot this year because of their, they have COVID tents out there. And consequently, we had to only do a pre-order sale and not a live sale. And we sold out, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. But every other year we have the sale the first weekend in May. And there's a group called habitatcorridors.org that I suggest you go look on. Lots of resources. Uh, and there are some uh, uh, videos under resources on that site taken of, of, of specialists making web video webinars this past year. Uh, one on birds, one on uh, dragonflies, one on bees. So you get, instead of the overview that I gave you today, you can get all sorts of de detailed information. That's the habitatcorridors.org. I mentioned Douglas Tallamy, the host plant specialization expert. You can get all sorts of information from his books. And I put midwestgroundcovers.com on here because they, they don't sell retail, but they have uh, plants, na native plants called Natural Garden Natives. And on their website, they have a list of the garden centers that sell their natural garden natives. So if you're looking specifically now from now going forward to buy native plants, there would be one resource for you. And I might just say, if you're looking for native plants in a garden center, go to the native plant database, for example, and get their Latin names as well as their common names so that you and your, when you're buying, if it's a native, it's going to have a, 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 a genus and a species like the purple coneflower is Echinacea purpurea. If there's another word after it, that means it's a cultivar and it may have lost some of the characteristics of the natives in the, in the, in the process of being cultivated. For example, a few years ago, the Botanic Gardens created a, an echinacea, echinacea that was a Echinacea purpurea golden glow. So it was a yellow purple coneflower, which doesn't make much sense, but you know, they're trying to hybridize things. Turned out it wasn't, it wasn't uh, winter 
uh, hardy, like the purple coneflower is. So look for the two Latin names if you have to write them down, you know, from a place like the database or other sources. And I mentioned the National Wildlife Federation uh, that has which plants support which insects and that information about which seeds, which kinds of seeds different birds like. And then there are the video resources that I mentioned. Uh, Chicago Living Corridors has the various uh, videos and Citizens for Conservation. For, to find these videos, go under education and then community education and they'll pop up at you there. It'll show you the various videos that have been recorded this year. So I'll leave that up if you want to write those down. But that's it. And so, oh my goodness, we went over uh, a lot. <laughs> I just looked Hi, at the Peggy. We kept our audience, so that's great. <laughs> okay, good. We do have a few minutes for questions if you have them. Yeah, we do have a few questions. Um, one of the first questions is uh, from Eva. She wanted to know, so silver maple is not native. She's asking whether that is true or not. That's true. That is it true. Is okay. <laughs> okay. A um, couple other questions that popped up recently. Do you have any recommendations to keep chipmunks out of your planters, bird feeders, et cetera? Oh boy. Um, I wonder, I, I haven't had the problems with them on the bird feeders, but I wonder if the, if the, uh, the conical uh, baffles that go to, to keep the squirrels from going up the post would also work for the chipmunks. Because you know they go up the post, they get inside the con the cone, and they can't get around it to get up onto the bird feeder. I right, think that works better. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I tried I tried putting Vaseline on the pole to one of the <laughs> bird feeders to keep the, the the squirrels down, and it did for a while, and then they decided I don't know that that was okay. I guess they didn't like getting the goo in their in their claws, but but it didn't it didn't last long. <laughs> Um, what, are, what is the best place in this area to buy these plants? I think you talked a little bit about in that in the resources, but to buy see, to, to buy the plants. Where where are the best? Where is the best place in the area to buy these plants? The native yeah. plants. Right now, uh, the uh, open lands in Chicago. It's a, it's an organization like Citizens for Conservation but they are having a native plant sale every weekend and you order them online and, and they, they're a little more expensive, but it includes delivery. So openlands.org, I think would be their website and, and look for native plant sales. Uh, I think for the next couple, may, maybe through May, they're still selling them. Otherwise you need to look for garden centers that, that specify native plants and look for the natural garden natives brand and and you'll know they are a, a locally grown native plant so that's a source uh there's another one um uh i'm gonna blank on his name right now uh ah, a tree company in uh way south suburbs we we buy our trees and shrubs from them for uh the the plant sale uh why am i Maybe it'll pop in my mind as I'm thinking about something else. <laughs> uh, they, they are, by the way, that that nursery that sells the trees and shrubs is also selling things through through open lands. So that could be a resource for you there. OK, um, I'm guessing this is a question from Matthew. Uh, I just a great, know a great <laughs> process for identifying all the current plants on property and wooded area. Citizens for Conservation has a program called Habitat Corridors. And in it, we visit uh, homeowners' yards and help with identification of, of not only what's there, but which ones are good and which aren't. And you know, there's some, some invasives to get rid of. <clears throat> we, it's free for members. So if somebody wants to join Citizens for Conservation, uh, the regular membership is $50 and the seniors, I think, is $35. But, uh, but, uh, but you can have a visit and, and, and pay for it if you're not a member. It really pays to become a member because you get lots of other resources that way. But anyway, uh, the, the people who visit know the plants and can not only advise on what's there, but also if you want information about what might be good. If you've got some invasives and you want to take them out, what, what you might want to replace them with. Wow, I that's great. I didn't realize that... Uh... 
Citizen for Conservation, they do something like that. Wow, it's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I just remember the name of the, re the oh. <laughs> possibility place. It sells trees and shrubs. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I answered that one, or you answered that one. Sorry. Um, just a lot of good comments. Uh, thank you, Peggy. Very informative and inspiring. Great job, Peggy. Thank you. Um, That's nice. I particularly like inspiring. I want you all to go and do something about this. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Peggy. What an excellent workshop. You really blew it out of the, you know, knocked it out of the park tonight. I was, I learned quite a bit, um, as I'm sure. I, 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 was, I was moving fast and covering a lot, but, but that was the purpose of it, to be an overview rather than an in-depth on any one area. Right. And as you said, I know that you mentioned this is a taped uh, video that you have on Citizens for Conservation, their website. I also taped our recording tonight. So if anyone needs to go back and replay certain sections or of tonight's program, well, it'll also be on the library's YouTube channel, um, you know, within the next day or two as well. So um, but I, I noticed you have some, you know, the three other, the two other programs that you guys are offering as well on your um, on your site. So those are probably definitely worth checking out as well for our audience. All right. Well, thank you, Peggy, so much. Thank you for hosting. It was great. And thank you for educating us tonight. Excellent program. Thank you. Right. All right. Take care. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.